All right. So for anyone just tuning in right now, my name is Antonio Lopez. I'm with Soundbridge Music. Just going to do a little cross-posting here, and we'll be doing the interview with our featured artist for the month of August, Teresa Storch, here shortly. So were you able to find that all right, Teresa? Yeah. Sweet. I'm watching myself. Sweet. <laughs> watching so, you right uh, now. Yeah, as people trickle in here, we'll kind of get started here. And hey, everyone listen at home. My name is Antonio Lopez, and I'm with Soundbridge Music. We are a nonprofit founded in 2017 as a grassroots effort to use the power of music to make a positive difference in communities across the Front Range. Today we have with us Teresa Storch. She is Soundbridge Music's featured artist for the month of August. Her and her music have garnered international attention, being chosen for the Top Country in Americana album of 2015 by Martin Chilton of The Telegraph UK. She has also been a Grassy Hill New Folk finalist at the Kerrville Folk Festival selected as an emerging artist at the Falcon Ridge Folk Festival and received honorable mention in the Rocky Mountain Folk Fest Songwriters Competition. Hey, Teresa, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today? Wow, I forget about all the cool stuff that's <laughs> happened to me. Like, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of cool stuff. Everything's so different now. <laughs> you know, like there's just so, I feel like I'm so not, moving like working hard towards my music career because it's just you know right now it's a time i think for us all just live totally, yeah it's, yeah it's hard with all these changes happening and the yeah. music community really being affected real hard by COVID 19 it's just it's yeah. hard to even know like where to put your efforts and what to work towards because everything's changing so much right yeah, and it can kind of, you know, just make you crazy to be like, I'm not doing enough. I should be doing live stream shows every week. I should be, you know, I don't know, putting up content, making YouTube videos. I should, you know, and or I should just, you know, help my stepkids with their schoolwork. And <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we've done it. We've, we've done both. You know, we've done some live stream shows. We've, we've done live shows from our driveway. We have a couple actual little, you know, socially distanced gigs that we've had. We have one tomorrow in Niwot, you know, this will be fun. Um, it's a, a town nearby Longmont, for those of you who don't know, those watching who aren't in Colorado. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a weird, it's definitely a weird year. It's weird. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Where are you going to be playing tomorrow? The Niwot Tavern. That's a, it's just a little pub that's, doing live music on their front patio and then they they aren't they don't have in you know service inside it's all a takeout and you can sit out front on this patio that they've created you know tables and chairs and they still serve they'll serve your you know you their fancy beverages and alcoholic drinks and such so you can come and have a weird it's like a happy hour from five to seven so oh, cool yeah, yeah so it's a fun gig yeah, and along sure. with peter tomorrow at nine tavern five to seven yeah, Peter with with my cohort Peter Lasis, partner in life, music, and crime. Yours. Cool. So <laughs> <those best> guitars. <laughs> so I have a really quirky question to ask you, Teresa. Cool. So yesterday I was hanging out with, uh, or not hanging out, but I was just talking with Trish, for, who's also from Soundbridge Music, and yeah. she was saying I needed to ask you about the proper technique for brushing your teeth because you like have this secret. <laughs> <laughs> you have a I love you, Trish. <laughs> I was trying to explain it to her. So yes, my father was a dentist. He's a retired dentist now, and uh, so I uh, find myself having to teach my stepkids like how to brush your teeth because there people don't realize there really is a special way to do it. Um, <laughs> I've never done this in an interview. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I <laughs> that question, right? Do you really want to know? I'll tell you. I really do want to know, yeah. <laughs> I love that you posted that thing about brushing your teeth before Zoom. <laughs> Antonio, just before this uh, event, posted a, a Facebook post about how, how he was brushing his teeth. And I'm like, I did too. Um, <laughs> so 
the point of brushing is to get the stuff out of your teeth. So you want to go down in the top levels and go up from the bottom. And you want to do that on the outside and the inside. And circles isn't really helpful. Like it's more like, you got to, it's almost like, you know, when you're flossing, you're going out and down, you're going up and down. So that's the. So you mean to tell me I was doing it wrong all along? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. And I wonder if, if A, dentists don't teach it or do they teach it differently? I mean, my dad is, you know, 80 something. So he's not, a, he's not a recent dentist. He was a dentist, you know, like in the 70s, 80s, 90s to, you know, I can't remember when he, 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 he was, it was in the seventies when he retired. So it wasn't that long ago, but okay. uh, that was how he always taught us to do it. So I feel like I never see people brushing their teeth that way. <laughs> but when I go to the dentist, Dennis always says, tells me, gosh, your teeth are really good. They're really clean. They're, I'm like, maybe I do a good job and I should tell people how I brush my teeth. <laughs> see, my dentist might've told me that. But all I could re really remember is like those little plastic uh, tooth cases mm -hmm. that they would give you to like put your teeth in. If you lost, yeah, when you lost it. Like tooth. pretty much all I remember. Yeah, when you lost your tooth. Like some it, of like, them had, were on a string, so you could like keep it around your neck. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's like all I remember. My my dad used to go to schools and demonstrate. I, I'm sure he went to came to my classroom. Um, because he had this like huge fake toothbrush it was like this long with the, you know had this big and a big fake set of teeth and he'd like practice on the teeth and show them how to do it so <laughs> he's a proponent of correct toothbrushing everywhere <laughs> <laughs> cool so, uh, uh, I understand you used to be a physicist I yeah. it's yeah well it's so funny because I did study physics I have a degree in engineering physics, it's like applied physics, basically, um, from the Colorado School of Mines here in Golden. And I did work like as a physicist for a couple of years at Luxmark, the printer company, which is not too far. Uh, when I graduated, I never got a graduate degree. Uh, it's interesting because what ended up happening is I would be in this lab taking all these measurements and it was a, we were working with lasers because it was laser printers we were working on. Mm -hmm. doing research on and I would sit in this dark room with this you know taking all these measurements and this all these instruments you know measuring things and I would be in there for hours by myself and I would start to write songs like songs would come to me in my head <laughs> that was one of the things like that was one of the first places where I started really writing songs because I was bored <laughs> I, was, I was alone in this dark room for hours <laughs> and I would sing to myself and I would and uh, I have a song called Choose Your Battles that I wrote in that uh, it was on my first album like from 2002 uh, but we just started doing it again with my band so it's it's been kind of fun re re rejuvenating that song that I wrote so long ago but it was really about Choose Your Battles being like choose the thing you want to fight towards or fight about and because I, I I realized I wasn't so happy in what I was doing and it was like is this the thing I want to like put all my energy towards in my life and I wasn't sure. So shortly after that, I actually quit and got a different job doing software, software engineering, um, which was sort of a fluke. Like it was at the time in the late nineties where they really were looking for anyone to hire it. I learned on the job and that's, I've been doing software engineering work off and on since, since then. Uh, and then I could say that I, I do actually attribute the uh, dot-com bust of the early late late 90s early 2000s for my music career because <laughs> I got laid off kept getting laid off. I got laid off five times in four years and it um and I was at the time living in Boston Massachusetts yeah and so it was it was a really you know and all, actually to be honest the first time I got laid off was August of 2001 right before 9-11 and so at that point there were no jobs like they, I was so what it, I do to make a living at that point was I busked in the wow. subways and on the streets. So it became my job. It became the way I, I lived on unemployment and busking for uh, seven months until I could find another job. And at that point I was so like, I'm gonna do music. By that point, I just loved playing music every day. And uh, I, you know, I don't think I could have given myself, you know, I don't think I could have honestly 
uh, quit the safety of a nice job, like a software job and just done music without, you know, having a lot of fear around it. And it just, because God made the decision or whoever, whatever, like I had no opp opportunities other than, you know, creating my own, like via music. So it gave me the, the chance to try it as a career. And it was, I was so happy. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a really great story to I'm share. So I never knew that about you. And yeah, you know, it's like the circumstances like that, you would, something like that would have to happen to you to make that jump. Like you wouldn't just like leave that secure job to yeah. go because there would be all these reasons like, oh, that's too risky. Like, I, I don't want to leave this secure job. But by being that you laid off, got laid off four or five times, like in that succession of years. Yeah, every time I would be yeah. like, okay, I'll do more music, you know, I, then I would find like a part-time job and work for a while and get, get laid off again. And I, I made some really amazing strides though forward with my music with just like what ended up happening is then I ended up with a job working for a, a music, um, <clears throat> it was called Artist Development Associates. It was a company that sold CDs online. It was like a CD baby. It was called CD Freedom out of Massachusetts. And so via that, I was working on their websites and I was meeting a lot of the artists around in the scene. And it was really amazing. Like all the people I got to talk to on the phone, like, you know, we'd be putting their CDs up online and have to understand their information or whatever they wanted posted, et cetera. Um, so it was a great opportunity that I found via like the blend of my music and, and being having actually the skill to build websites for a software company. Cool. Yeah. And I bet that kind of helped with your music career as you, as you were making that transition, just kind of utilizing skill sets you ha already had, applying yeah. them in a new field and putting it all together. No, I like, don't look at my website. It's <laughs> 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 I haven't updated it in years. That's so funny. Like we, we, Peter and I, my partner, we were just talking about like, God, I really do need a new, like a new theme. I need new images. I mean, it's still cool, I think, but uh, yeah, it's, that's, you know, you feel like every time you got a few years, you got to refresh it and you can't get some new marketing stuff. I'm not the best marketing person. I mean, I can make the website, but to make it look cool, not always easy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, that takes a lot I'm of skill. Still... <laughs> yeah, if you ever figure it out, please let me know because I spent so much time just, okay, being like, okay, I'm going to work on my website and mm -hmm. hours pass and you're like, wow, I changed the font and changed the size of it and maybe yeah. change this color to that color but i'm still yeah. sure <laughs> and i love well we've used some themes like there's themes you can use to like i don't know create the backgrounds a little bit but so you can kind of test things out but yeah it's not easy i mean i almost want to hire people I and mean, peter helped me he actually has more experience with that that side of things the, the graphical you know make things look nice on on a computer <laughs> yeah. So, uh, did Trish have any more crazy questions? Uh, let me text her quick, see if she has any other. <laughs> I'm just uh, I was going to ask you. So, like, I've lived in Colorado my whole life, growing up down in southern Colorado, and Love the it. only pla two places I've ever lived are Alamosa and Longmont. Aww. So, I'm always kind of curious talking to people that have been a part of other music scenes besides Colorado, and I know through like. The Rocky Mountain Song School and Lions, there's kind of a big contingent of people f from the Boston area that come out to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's just like a pretty good like songwriter, songwriter community out in Boston. So I'm just kind of curious in your thoughts of, you know, similarities between our scene here and their scene out there and some differences. It's kind of your, your take on that. Hmm. that. It was interesting coming from there. I mean, the fact I started in Boston, it was I think I was very lucky because there is such a strong songwriter scene there. And I mean, it's true. A lot of them have to come out here for the Rocky Mountain Song School or to you know, play festivals and such. Um, I mean, I learned about it. I learned about song school when I was living in Boston, <laughs> which is so crazy because I went from Colorado to Boston and back. I was in Boston for 10 years and it's like 99 to 09. And uh, it, Gosh, gosh, that's really interesting. It's such an interesting question. When I moved back to Colorado, I really missed that scene because it, it's a very, it's, there's so many amazing musicians. In my life, 
out there, like, honestly, I could go out every night and see people play and you know, see my friends play, really. I could go, and there's this Irish pub I can still probably walk into today and see people I know and where I played like so many times, it was like playing in my living room. And I'm sure I'd get hugs from people who are like, hey, how have you been? I haven't seen you. And you're like, well, I moved away. But, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Like, there's such a strong scene. And, and there was this one songwriter note on Sundays that at this one pub that a lot of us would, would just hang out at together. I wish we had a place like that here more. I mean, I would find it in various open mics. Like, do you remember the Sky Brewery? I know we used to yeah. you know, connect there back when that was not happening open mic. And, I mean, I just really was trying to find more of a solid community here for a long time. And even in you know, 09, 2009, there really wasn't much going on in Longmont yet. Right. And I'm so, it's been so great to watch it grow. And we love being a part of it and trying to help it grow. And gosh, Soundbridge music, you know, that's amazing to have something like this in our community. So I think we're getting there, you know, like Boston's an old city. It's you know, the music scene, there's Berkeley School of Music. There's um, where I live in particular was was you know, on the Cambridge side. If you, and you, if you, know, you know, when you go out there, it's, it's, there's different, you know, pieces of the Boston metropolitan area and Cambridge was definitely where like a lot of the folk music started. There's Club Passim, which was one of the, it's like an really old folk club places, place like, you know, um, Bonnie Ray and I mean, uh, so many people got their start playing in that club and it was such an honor to get to go and play there. Um, you felt like you were like in a part of history. That's what's mm -hmm. so cool about it being in you know, such an old town. Um, but I think Longmont is, it's getting there. I mean, it's growing. I love, I love the fact that this scene has gotten so, um, I don't know, bountiful. I don't know what word, word I want to use. Yeah. You know, there's just so many artists of all kinds, music and art and you know, painting and sculpture. And um, there, there've been a lot of venues, but I know in the recent, months sadly a lot of those venues are closing and yeah it's hard it's really hard heartening. for the future you know because it's like yeah Long has come such a long way in the last few years with uh yeah. just the arts community and music community and it it'll be sad to see if a lot of that momentum dissipates as a result of COVID-19 and that's kind of the main reason why I stepped into this executive director role of Soundbridge is to just try to uh, put myself in service of the community and hopefully try to keep some semblance of that together. And, you know, at the same time, while a lot of this is falling away, we can't be so sad about it because the old music system, like it was kind of mess, like wasn't the most equitable system. So maybe out of these ashes, we could build something that's a little better. Yeah. No, but it is just kind of real, no, I think you're well, right. Worry, so I'm it's, thinking about it and just being like, wow, what if uh, the, how many venues are going to be left in this town after this? And Yeah, I mean, like Still Sellers was one that we played all the time and had an idea of like, well, can we take it over? I know there's a new distillery that's taken in, you know, residency in their space, but gosh, you know, could we create something like that ourselves or use their space or I don't know, create, I mean, Peter and I have even thought about our basement. Like, could we start uh, when we when we're able to gather again? Can we start a house concert series in our basement? Can we um, just feel like what can we do to help this community and build a music scene? You know, it's just yeah. you know, there's That's kind of what I see happening is like the house concert scene and mm -hmm. that like really making a resurgence. You know, because musicians are still going to want to play and they're still going to want to be an audience that wants to hear music. Yeah. So maybe the the dots that of how those two are connected will just be a lot more direct and immediate. And you know, when you really look at like the logistics of like putting on a, a show, you know, like if you were to do a a bigger show that was like a two hundred capacity room, it's like even if you pack that out, when you really pay everyone out, it's like really how much money do you make from that and sometimes you could do like a house concert that's 30 people and that could end up working out better oh so yeah it's kind of a weird thing you know the way that the economics of music mm -hmm. end up working out yeah when i was a i mean so for 10 years i i think actually i never got to this part like there were 
it was a good eight, eight to 10 years of some time I wasn't traveling so much, but I was, I was a touring artist, like living in Boston. And then I ended up moving here. And some of the years were when I lived here um, mm -hmm. before I worked full time, like I was basically working part time, whatever jobs I could find and software or whatever. I did a catering job in Boston and, and cause I wanted to do as much music as I could and traveled around the country playing and house concerts was like the one thing that really supported me, like helped me keep going at it because they, they really are great. They're so, they're, they're so awesome. The way you, there's no overhead. There's, you know, you don't have a club to, to pay and it's the people who do, who put them on are so generous. I mean, they, it's, it's amazing. They do, they work so hard and they, they always just, they do it to, really to help us all. So I, I'm so grateful for those, those opportunities. Um, and I miss it. I do miss being on the road. I mean, I, since I got off the road in 2012 and went back to full-time software engineering, uh, cause I was burned out. You know, I got tired of, of all the travel and being gone and not having a boyfriend or, you know, I was just, go it was so hard. It, it was so fun and free and amazing to travel and see the, the country and see the people like all you know I have so many music friends all over the country from that experience and then gosh it was I just got to a point where I just needed to stay home for a while and make some money and, and now I try to do both I man I don't travel as much but we still try to get out we travel to Europe when we can sometimes to play shows and work our day jobs too <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah so, uh, balance places that you've traveled what have been some of your favorite both in terms of like venues and or, in, and or just cities or so fun um well, we've been so lucky that we we've met a i met a, a a lovely promoter from scotland his name's rob ellen i don't know if you're out there rob some he's always he's all over facebook <laughs> he, he has an organization called medicine show promotions medicine show music and he promotes uh you know artists from all over the world really um but he helped me get do my first you know tour out and well the last record I put out he did some good promotion for it and helped me get some good reviews and such out in England and London that's where I got that that cool uh, quote you had there about me uh, getting into this like top country Americana albums of the year in 2015 yeah. pretty cool and uh anyway so Scotland is amazingly beautiful if you've never been there I would it's the people are kind of Colorado, like they're super laid back and down to earth. You go to England and I, they're beautiful people too. They're just a little different, you know, they're just a little more reserved and they're just, they're super kind, you know, Scotlanders are a little more wild. They're more, <laughs> they're more the partiers as it seems. Uh, we, so we've played like the coolest probably thing I think we played was this festival called Belladrum and up in the Highlands part of Scotland. 40,000 people, not that we played to 40,000 people. There's so many different event, you know, different stages that are happening at the same time, but gosh, it was such a crazy event. Uh, so much fun to be a part of. Um, it's called the Belladrum Festival. Look it up. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, we played some really cool places in London and, in, you know, other cities in England. There's this boat that I play on. I've played it three times now. It's like on the coast of England that has a restaurant in this town called Wells next to the sea. And uh, that was just really cool. I mean, it's just, it's just much, it's a tourist area and, you know, they, people love the music and you're sitting out on top of a boat. It's like old Dutch schooner, I think is what it is. That's been docked and turned into a restaurant it get, does go out to sea sometimes i don't you know but uh really really cool to play there um played some really i don't know there's a cool festival we did in ireland and um i don't know what else but then like some of the other i guess if i should go back to the u.s i loved like new orleans new orleans has so much music if you ever just to get a chance to go down there and i uh, played just yeah you know, i just played a dive bar but it was awesome <laughs> It didn't, it was, I think it's called, it was called Checkpoint Charlie's and it was just so much fun. And I, cause I happened to get the night, it was like the Wednesday before the Thursday of, of Mardi Gras. So it was like the night before it got crazy, but people were in town yeah. and I was like, it was so fun. And just that, just to be there and all that music, you walk down the street there and there's so much live music everywhere. So I could go on. Yeah. <laughs> 
I had been there for the first time this past January. That's where like the Folk Alliance International Conference was, and I made it out to that. Right. I we so so bummed we missed that one. I really wish we'd tried hard to. I because I've been to several Folk Alliances, and and I'm like, oh, Kansas City before that, before New Orleans, it was in Kansas City, and it was so close and convenient. And it's like, oh, do we do it? Do we, you know? And I, I kind of bummed we missed it. But... Yeah. How was it? Yeah. What did you, what did you get to do? Anything cool when you were there? Uh, see anything fun? Or yeah, you know. Music even that you saw. Yeah, you know, uh, kind of one of the coolest things that happened is, so I, I went this year in 2020, and the last time I went was in 2015. Mm -hmm. And when I went in 2015, I was just like, hey, I need to go to this every year. And I got so much out of it. But um you know, just circumstance and how time flies. Like it took me five years to get back there because it is kind of a uh, pricey endeavor to go to Folk Alliance. It is. Uh, yeah. One thing that's kind of cool is that I ran into Angus, who's like the head of Folk Alliance. And I had written him like a handwritten thank you note after the 2015 conference. And he was saying how he keeps that note on his desk wow. as like a daily reminder of Folk Alliance's mission. And wow. It was just really cool because uh, I was just basically telling him, like, a, as a person of color, like, playing the music I play, sometimes I feel on the outside in a lot of ways. And just, like, I really like the way they're bringing more different voices to the table with just, like, the type of programming they're doing and the type of talks they're having. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just really cool because, like, in 2020, that was, like, a really big component of the whole conference and like yeah. ov overarching tone to it all and Yay. maybe uh, Yay, folk one letter like i wrote in 2015 like had a part in that because he was saying like he keeps it on his desk as a daily reminder so that was just kind of like one of those weird moments where you, you know you meet someone who is one of the popular people at, at a big old social gathering and, and you just kind of be like hey like nice to see you or whatever but for them to be like, no, hey, yeah, I totally know who you are, and thank you for what you did, and so that was kind of like a, a really cool wow. moment from this last Folk Alliance. Good, that's awesome. Oh, that, wow! Thank you for doing that, and thank. I mean, that's so, that's so cool that they, that one letter you wrote had such a big impact. And isn't that crazy? Like you have no idea, like you had no idea, right? You know? No idea. I, yeah. Love that. <laughs> I love that. Like, and it, I mean, yeah, I, it's, that organization has grown so much. I mean, I started going, God, my first one was like 2004, mm -hmm. I think. And it was in San Diego. I drove from Boston. Like I made a tour wow. <laughs> from Boston to San Diego. Back. It was insane. I mean, I was like my second ever tour and I'm like, I'm going to do this, you know? But it really is a great, I mean, it's such a great organization and gave me such a motivation to like, I have, I have a thing to go to. Like, I am going to get myself out there and be at this conference. And I was, you know, and it's really, and I've made friends there, you know, I've kept ever since, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're really, really important to our, to our, to what we do and our scene, you know. So I'm so glad, I'm so glad you're going to them too. Okay, well, next year or. Yeah, whenever they can have them again. Yeah, well, what's crazy is uh, <laughs> even like early on in the pandemic, they decided to even cancel the 2021, I'm pretty sure. I think they did, yeah. So it's just like, yeah, yeah I mean, it makes sense, you know, it's, it's such like an international type thing to coordinate and there's so much logistics and so much for planning that, yeah, you could, you could see how they just canceled yeah, so far in yeah. advance. So but, far in advance, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I see now that we do have a question from someone on Facebook. And David Coyle. Aww. Says, have you ever written a song to accompany a dance you choreographed or vice versa? <laughs> He's one of the few people who know my other background in the music scene here. Um, so yeah, my other life before music, I was a ballet dancer. <laughs> I know, like, <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up dancing with Ballet Omaha. So I grew up in Omaha. I don't know if you know this, actually. I did. Nebraska. 
Yeah, so I grew up there and I danced with Bally Omaha all through high school, you know, junior high through high school. Ballet was my thing. I mean, that was like, I loved performing. It was where I got my addiction to performing and being on the stage. It, I think I brought on, brought into being a songwriter. Um, I played a little, you know, I played some piano. I played a little guitar when I was young, but then I just, ballet became my focus. And then I came out to college here in, at School of Mines and then started dancing with Boulder Ballet. So that was my, I did that until I was about 25. Um, it was really, it was awesome. That was one of those things like, I I just love being in a, in a dance world and such, but when you get to be 25, it's hard to keep going. You know, it's like, a, it's such a young, young person's art form because your body and all that. And, and it was around that time that I around 25 was when I really decided to switch and focus on being a songwriter and, and uh, focus on music. I have not, what was the question? Did I choreograph a dance to the song that I've written or did I? What was yeah, so have you ever uh, choreographed a dance to something you've written? I have not. Written a song to, some, to a dance, like vice versa. I have not done either. That's really lame. I really that's should like, do that's that. A quarantine project for you. Yeah. There's going to be like the Teresa Storch, like ballet <laughs> debut in like 2022. That would be so fun. But I have been in a piece. So I have a lovely um, fiddle player I play with sometime. Her name is Kristen Demery. And she's actually one of my dearest friends from my Boulder Ballet days. We, we were in the Boulder Ballet company together. And she still teaches and choreographed a take her ballet class when I can. Um, so I'm, I'm not in the greatest ballet shape, but I try to be, you know, try to do a little bit. And, uh, she did a piece that I actually got to perform and she wrote all the music. She performed, she and her, you know, a few of friends of hers, like created the music, performed it all. And she also, she also choreographed the piece. It was really amazing. And I just got to be a dancer in it. it and it's called Spider Dance. It was based on the Tarantella. Yeah. You know the Tarantella, yeah. so based on that folk dance, and she created a sort of like a mini mini ballet. It was a small piece that we did in a, a we did it in a, at a dance festival in Denver that was called Presenting Denver. It was done at DU in twenty. It was twenty eighteen now. It's two years ago. Uh, so that was really cool. That's the last like dance thing I've been in, but that was a. It was fun. I mean, it was really inspiring to see how she created the music, and then she would bring us the music and you know try to create. With, the dance with it and then sometimes it'd be like this music doesn't quite fit i'm gonna work on this and she'd go home and like work on the recording and come back it was wild what a what a trip so i thanks david that's a great idea um and i know you're a great dancer david coyle because we every time we hang out anywhere where there's live music he's up there dancing i don't know if you know this about him <laughs> he loves to yeah, he's got some good he good. loves to dance so we dance together at various various live music shows um but, and we also he and i wrote a song together that uh was based on a, the concept of a ballet dancer a russian ballerina and the, how she broke this guy's heart and uh, we we were gonna add so much more to the song we were like had this idea that, like the russian mafia was after her and you know that's why she had to leave so fast and it and we, that was just a little too deep we just didn't have time <laughs> <laughs> make it that interesting so it just ended up being a broken heart love song kind of you know but it, it well i i don't i think we played it one of his last uh one of his last the, the gigs he has about all the the january songwriting event he does, oh, he does yeah. song every day in january and then yeah the show together so cool. anyway yeah so we actually have another question as well oh. and this one is from trish and I'm thinking this question could be a perfect way to lead into you sharing a few songs. But Trish wants to know if you have a favorite song of yours and also about a song you love to perform the best. Wow. Um, I mean, I guess the one that's had the most like impact lately is the the one that's sort of the Me Too type song that I wrote. I wrote it a few years ago, but uh, um, I could do that. It's, it's, you know. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I, uh, it really is the most sort of powerful one that I think I, when I play it solo, I mean, since this is solo, 
Yeah. Uh, but I'll play a happier song after that, maybe. I'm gonna grab my key. <laughs> All right. But I wrote this, um, I actually wrote this before the Me Too movement. It was the, oh God, what was, what was his name? It was after the, the story broke about, what was his name? He was like a swimmer at Stanford. He was a, a college guy and how he assaulted this woman that he met at a party um, and how they let him off pretty easy because like he, they didn't want to ruin his like Olympic dreams or his career, you know, the potential. And, and it was really appalling. And um, gosh, what was his name? Ah, someone will remember for me. I used to know it. Brock Taylor. What was his name? Brock Taylor. Brock. Brock Taylor. Taylor? Brock Taylor? Brock, yeah, something. Brock something. Brock. Turner. Brock Turner. Anyway, so this isn't really about that specific event, but I, it just got me thinking about, wow, you know, we need to be heard, women need to be heard. It's not even, um, not even a somewhat, somewhat, somewhat autobiographical, but not really. I and mean, I was trying to just sort of incorporate a, a bunch of ideas of how women have experienced the world for so long. And so just wanted to put my own voice out there, I guess. Here you think it's just what people say. I hear you meant nothing by it. I heard you claim it's just how you were raised. But still, I say it's not okay. I'll ignore it to keep you at bay. I won't react to keep my job. I'll laugh along, just hoping you'll go away. Still, I say it's not okay. Yesterday it was an off-color comment Now today it's an unwanted touch And I must say that I feel like an object The way that you're staring Seeming such I'm not a land to be conquered. I'm not some goal to achieve. I am not here just for your pleasure, not something to use and to leave. I deserve your respect, and I deserve my equal rights for it to never be an issue. And not fear walking home at night. I hear you think it's just what people say. I hear you meant nothing by it. I heard you claim it's just how you were raised. Still I say, it's never okay, still I say, it's not okay. Wow, thank you, Teresa. That was really powerful. And that brought a feeling back to me that, uh, 
I really miss, you know, just that feeling that like a really good folk song could give you when it's like hold space in a room. Wow. And just like something really tender and wow, what, what, what powerful words in that song. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's one of those like, I used to be afraid to sing it, I have to admit, like, because it would sort of choke me up and it would also feel like a fear of that I would, I didn't want to like offend people in the room or feel like I was going to be like making people feel that like the male population in the room feel uncomfortable. And I, you know, I took, it was honestly, it was at a folk alliance. I started bringing it out finally. And I had more and more people who were like, you know what? You really need to play that song. Like men too. Like that's a really honest, just conversation or just like point of view. And, and uh, I was like, okay. And that's what was like one of the good things about those folk alliances is getting the feedback and knowing like, yeah, we make our little songs sometimes. At least I have feel sometimes I make a little song and I don't know what, how it's gonna touch someone else and how it, you know, so that's really great. And we have the community here in Longmont too. That's a, I miss the open mics. I miss the, you know, connection with the people, any kind of gig, you know, <laughs> especially yeah. these, you know, the one, one person in a song, you know, a guitar in a song. Um, should, should I play something else? What do you think? Yeah. Yes, yeah, oh, yeah. so, uh, man, this this time has just been going so fast. I know. So, well, you want to share one more song, and then take us out with the song, and maybe before you play it, maybe just share with people where to follow you, where to find you online, mm-hmm. anything else you'd like to share with people. Yeah, um, cool. So yeah, I'm at TeresaStorch.com. I mean, it's a T E R E S A, but I think you'll find me. I can misspell it. Um, but Teresa, just Google Teresa Storch, Torch with an S. You'll find me and find me on Facebook and they're the same. I have a regular person account and an artist account. Um, do an awesome band. I'm so proud of. We really hope to get back out there soon. Um, aside from my driveway, hopefully, you know, I think Labor Day, we're going to do another driveway event and Facebook live stream it. So look for that. Labor Day weekend, the band, hopefully we can get, I don't know which day um but we are also working on a new album and uh gosh i wonder if i should play something from well that's gonna be on that old that was an older that's a a new song that i'm gonna put on the new album i'm so excited it's called the not not okay what i just played um i think i'll play something from my my last album that i put out uh another one let's see This is one that's called Happy Girl. And it reminds me a lot. What? I was going to say, this is my favorite song of yours. Oh, you know it? I'm right on. Thank yeah. you. That's a badass song. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> I am proud of this one. This is a, so do you know Tim Reardon? You must know Tim, Timmy Reardon and I do, the yeah. songwriting. Yeah. I wrote, I wrote the Happy Girl. I wrote this song on one time it was a few you know years back when i was touring and i was doing a fearless songwriter week and what this is for those who don't know you write a song every day for a week and you post it online or whatever it doesn't have to be perfect just write something just to get yourself in the habit of writing every day and i was doing a lot of driving and i i wrote this while i was literally driving my car and had the words coming up in my head and i didn't really have a guitar for it and i had to go and figure this out um after the fact so it's kind of an interesting little like roundabout way like the way i wrote it chad my bass player our bass player we share a bass player and joey now and i <laughs> he's like yeah that's a weird song like that's <laughs> it's not a normal structure I'm like because well, <laughs> i wrote it way like totally away from my guitar and uh it was inspired though by daryl scott and he had a song called happy uh he had a song called crooked roads and in that he has a line about being a happy man and I was listening to that album as I was driving and I was inspired to, to write this about my life at the time, which was traveling and playing music and doing part-time jobs and not making enough money and struggling and yet my life was amazing. So it's good, it's bad at all. It's just, yeah, so thank you. 
thank you so much for having me. Antonio, this was so much fun. Let's do it again. I don't know, even if we're not online. <laughs> we should hang out. And thank you to Trish too, because she's the one of the other people who helps her run in Soundbridge. She's been a dear friend and a good uh, supporter of my music. So I really, really am grateful for you guys. Yeah. That's like one of those songs I could just listen to over and over again. <laughs> you. That means a lot coming from you, man. That's great. Yes, Patricia, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with me. Once again, I'm Antonio Lovis from Soundbridge Music, Teresa Storch. I put a link to her website if you want to check out more and learn more about her and her music. And signing out for now. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah. Bye-bye. Hey guys, thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for everyone tuning in on Facebook. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys. Facebook land. Yeah. <laughs>